Welcome to The Growing Band Director, the podcast that dives into topics applying to all of us band directors. My name is Kyle Smith, and joining me is my friend and colleague, Jeff Smith. Together, we discuss many aspects of a school band program, including how to build your concert, jazz, and marching programs, as well as everything else we do as band directors. More importantly, we'll discuss concepts that help us all improve our own programs every day. Always remember the famous quote by Ray Kroc, when you're green, you're growing, and when you're ripe, rot. Let's get started. So yeah, the, the bass clarinet, what ended up happening was the, the, when I just turned it a little bit, right. It, it ended up working fine. So it's a two piece bass clarinet instead of a solid piece. Yeah. Yeah, if I had known that, I would just said the bridge key was not set up right. I, I used to one piecers because uh, I always had problem. I always had problems with two piecers, especially during marching season. We'd be playing along, and piece A would go right, and piece B would go left, <laughs> and the tendon would be sheared off. So I stopped buying them. Yeah. But that one that you loaned, um, Angelina, not a bad horn at all older horn but it had a lot of clearness through all the registers i was very impressed yeah those horns have played great joe's worked on them a bunch they're super old i think they're leblancs right veto the, the yeah it was a veto horn, whatever yeah and they uh they tend to play well and joe bet yeah. i don't know if you and i have talked about joe but he he is like the magician of all things uh repair and he uh, he's great so where, where is he located uh, he lives at Cape Elizabeth. He's he's retired. He has his own business, um, and he worked for Music and Arts for a super long time. But he like he has he has a great uh, clinic. He does at Allstate that's called Five Minutes Before the Downbeat. Like all the stuff that breaks right before the concert that you need to fix. Like what are those tips and tricks? And he can, I mean, he can just he can just fix it anything right away if it can be fixed quickly. Right. Yep. So. The- Spring routine for a ligature, dental floss, the use of gum and zigzag paper, uh, making a spring with a paper clip or a um, straight pin, stuff like that. Yeah. That's well, cool. Well, I'm excited to do this second episode. The first episode went well, I thought. We talked about jazz band and, and that stuff. And today we're talking about um, the concert band rehearsal. And I, I, I would like to turn it into like a bag of tricks of all these things that we can do to make our concert band rehearsals go well. And we're going to talk about how it's the most important ensemble we teach, right? And how everything else feeds off of that. But I wanted to start by sharing a, a story with you. Because we we had band rehearsal today at the end of the day. And it was one of those, you know, you get to those Fridays. And some Fridays are just Fridays. And other Fridays are like, whoa, there's like stuff happening, right? So I noticed, you know, like the kids are coming in the room and the energy is like everywhere. There's just so much energy. And our classes are so long you know, they're like 75 minutes. It's not like a 35 or 40 that I can like, let's just play a lot of like loud, fast stuff and be done. Like we had to do some things. And so I talked to my student teacher and I was like, this is, they're in one of those moods right now. I have to do something about this. So it was really cool because I knew that. And my whole goal was to basically take their heart rate and just lower it down and get them to focus for the rehearsal, right? So, so what I decided to do was when I got on the podium and they weren't ready right away. They didn't stop right away when I had asked them to. So I said, nope, no problem. Keep playing. We'll try that again. So I got off. Of course, I, I was just being annoying, right? And I, I got on and they did it quickly. And then I had them do breathing. Four bars in or so four beats in, four beats out. That, you know, we did a little bit of breathing just to get them to like, okay, let's mm-hmm. just calm down, right? And uh, after that... Uh, what did we do? We did like some um, F, F major, uh, sorry, just Remington F. You repeat after me, right? Like um, quarter notes, eighth notes, triplets, just getting them like kind of playing all together, blah, 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 blah. We worked into this F. We then moved to E flat major and we did like a simple chorale, right? 
just like played it really, really well. And then I let them switch up parts in the chorale so they did something different. I then had them go to the minor version of that tune and of that scale because we were doing the Shostakovich prelude in E flat minor. So I, that was a transition to that. So anyway, we did like a couple of little basic exercises in that to get them going. And uh, we did like this one, two, one exercise, which I know you know, but um, for people who listen, it was like one, one, two, one, one, two, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, five, four, three. You just add one. We didn't do it that fast. Um, and then we did it in two parts, highs and lows. And then we did it alternating people. So ones and twos and ones and twos. So they had to do it with people around them doing the other part, right? So I just really got their brain focused on like working and getting better without reading too much music. And then we were able to go right into the Shostakovich E flat minor and then work on the other pieces we had to do. And by the end, we were working on some fast, high, loud stuff and they had a great end to the rehearsal. And I was really proud of that because at the beginning of the rehearsal, it very well could have been like a, oh, this is going to be one of those rehearsals and we're just going to slug it through and go. But I was like, nope, I can read them. And then I have enough tools in my tool bat, toolkit to be able to create a good rehearsal from it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was I was proud of that. And I wanted to share that story because, you know, today is really all about like, what are the tools that you've used? What are tools that I've used? And, um, you know, and how do we get good rehearsals more often than not? Yeah. Yeah. You got to keep your percentages as high as possible. Um, so so what I'd like to do is just start with a quick like we both believe the concert band is the center of the program. Um, and for me, it's about building a culture of success, class behavior, enthusiasm, musicianship, performing students, like all these things comes from that concert band rehearsal. Um, can you give us just your sort of philosophy of how the groups work together and, and, and all that? Okay, well, I believe, as you do, that the hub of the music program, band music program, is the concert band. From that are the different spokes of the wheel, the marching band, the jazz ensembles, the jazz combos, the small ensembles, the students who play with the orchestra, the students who play in pit orchestra, the students who play in other ensembles. But my rule was always, if you want to be in any of those ancillary ensembles, you must be an active and positive member of the concert band program. I did marching band a little bit different than you do. Um, to be, marching band was part of the curriculum for the first quarter, for the first um, 10 weeks of the quarter. Contra band went on during school, marching band at night, and I had arrangements with my athletic directors that uh, we rehearsed in the evening from 5.30 to 5 o'clock, pardon me, to 8 o'clock at night, two nights a week, full band, and then all day Saturday, and then percussion and guard had their sectionals. And then depending on where we were in the season, sometimes we'd have a an ensemble rehearsal for wins only another night. And uh, that worked well for us. And uh, it didn't create any numerical changes in the, the attrition of the program. Um, and then kids from that went to jazz and kids went to the other groups, but they had to be in concert band to do it. And the one thing that I found that was a, a real positive was that it took care of all the likes of kids. There are some kids, they just wanted to play jazz. And there are some kids that just wanted to do marching. And there were some kids who just wanted to do winter percussion. And there were some kids who just wanted to do small ensembles and some who just wanted to do all state. And I said, well, that's great. I'm glad you all like to do these things, but to do those, you must be part of the concert band so that it's part of the curriculum. And my analogy was simply this. When you take algebra, can you say that I don't do polynomial equations, so I'm not going to do that part of algebra? Or I'm in English, I don't do major British writers, so I, I just skip that part of the curriculum. No, the whole curriculum was learning all the different facets. And what I found from it was that I had a great number of kids who said, oh, I want to play is jazz. In the end, said, you know, I love playing jazz, but I've learned to love concert band far more than jazz because of how it fit into my life and how it led me along the way. And, um, and I think that was a recurring thing. I've, I've got a lot of kids who are out playing professionally and um, they all say, yeah, but I learned a lot about being a musician from concert band. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, you know, I've had people who say that the chamber music is the center of their program because that 
you know, that's where the kids really learn how to play. Um, and I understand that too. You know, concert band is more accessible, getting everybody in. But I think there's mm -hmm. this common misconception, right? Concert band's boring, jazz band and marching band are fun. Like that's like a, a thing. That because if if you don't teach concert band well, it can get long and boring, right? Another con, con um, you know, it's just not the case. Marching band should be loud and not musical. Jazz band should be high and loud. These are all false things, right? Like no matter what group you teach, teach musicianship, teach all the emotions. Um, if you tap into student and human emotions, you're going to be successful, right? So, I so go ahead. I, I agree with you 100%. I, I do a lot of judging, whether it be in jazz, concert band, or marching band, or winter, winter guard, or winter percussion. And uh, the terms you said, like concert band ha isn't fun. I, I hear that, and I say, why? And it, it always comes down to the reason it's not fun is because how the rehearsal is approached yep. and how the rehearsal is run. It's, and some directors uh, get caught up on one thing, and they stay with it so long, it becomes tedious and the kids don't want to continue and then marching band some kids say well it's just got to be very spirited and very loud and i said no it doesn't it can be very musical and very lyrical and jasmine said uh, high and loud well there are those moments but if you teach repertoire that's conducive to the style you should be doing a little bit of everything and uh, i think it's all comes down to in the end how do we teach and how were we taught yep so um, yeah, so this is all about giving ideas for how to make those great rehearsals for kids, right? Um, so I'm going to do a short plug. Um, I'm able to separate in my concert band, which is our, our younger group. I have a separate class for percussion and a separate class for the wind players. And for anybody out there who's able to schedule it, for us, it was simple. It's just another section of concert band. And our, our guidance people are able to put them in the correct section of concert band. And it's been amazing because they can work on percussion ensemble, timpani stuff, snare drum stuff, mallet stuff, all the auxiliary percussion, um, percussion solos. They can do all these things they could never do if they were with the wind players. And the wind players also don't have to deal with the, the teacher dealing with percussion stuff. We can go slower and work on things that the wind players need. So I just, I put that as a plug out there for those people who might be able to separate into two sections. It also allows you to teach another band class and get to know the kids a little bit bigger. So um, I wanted to start maybe just giving some of my ideas on how I approach the week and how I approach some warm ups. If that's all right with you, Jeff. Sure. Okay. Um, can I make about what you're talking about with percussion? Yeah. I think it's a great idea. I wasn't afforded that because I had three separate concert bands and there wasn't enough room in the schedule to add another section. Yeah. But my colleague you know, who inherited my program um, was able to work it out where they were able to give him a stipend to allow an outside percussionist come in and he would take the percussionists three to four days a week and just work with them, as you said, and it's made a remarkable improvement in the the understanding and the abilities of the percussion. So if I could do it all over again, I would try to do it your way. Yeah, it's worked great. So for me, I have to plan the week ahead of time. So in our case, we had a concert that's supposed to be um, April 6th. It had to be mo it had to be moved up because of stuff going on in our community to March 23rd. So all of a sudden, the next five weeks turns into the next three weeks. So we had four pieces that we were really going to be doing. One of those has moved to another concert. Now we're down to three. And that's fine because the, the program is going to work really, really well. Um, but I have to plan for the week before the week starts. So I kind of go, okay, if these th the three pieces we want to do, how many times do I want to do this piece? How many times do I want to do that piece? How many times do I want to do this piece? Because I find if I don't plan that out ahead of time, we might do one piece four days in a row and we don't touch another piece, right? So the looking um, long-term first works really well. Um, for me, I tend to choose a key of the week to warm up in. Um, I'm going to get to like scale work and stuff uh, later, but I try to just plan that that big stuff right now. How much time? What number of pieces? Is this a, a day that we work on one piece the whole time? Is this a thing that we do like three different pieces, but uh, different portions of it? Um, you know, so I'll try to plan that in my head ahead of time. Um, and then I'll take the rehearsal plan for the day and I'll always put it on the board. Right. I know that's not a, a new thing, but when the kids will walk in, they can see, OK, what are we doing today? They can have their stuff ready um, and they can be uh, uh, ready to go. Um, that makes them responsible for having their percussion stuff out that's needed or their music in order um, uh, and all that. 
So I want to start talking about some warm-up stuff, but I wanted to let you jump in and anything you had to say about what I was talking about. Well, I, I agree. I used to, I too had to have my lesson plan submitted by 7.30 in the morning on Monday for every week. And we did our concert program based on every eight weeks we had a concert, no matter what. And um, wh how we did it was that same as you. It was on the board for the whole week so they knew what they had to practice for what days and specifically what sections. We, we I did it so Another that they're- way to do that too is you can, if you don't have room on your board, you can post the rehearsal on the, the wall as they come in or whatever so they can see what days are we doing the Granger or what days are we doing Holster or whatever. Yep. That's another way. And now, back then, I we didn't have the internet like you have now. You could also send out an email or a text to all the kids saying what's going on ahead of time so they know. Um, but we did, We I had a rule. My warm-ups never lasted more than five minutes. Yep. Within five minutes, we did breathing. We did lip slurs. We did uh, B-flat scales in different patterns. We do the one, one-to-one -one like you're going to talk about later. And then we did all of the major scales up and down with an arpeggio okay. then when we finished with that depending on what pieces we were doing we would take the um that and play a chorale in that section or some kind of piece in that section uh what we did though is we took sections of the pieces and we highlight what we were working on because i wanted to work on every piece every day i had them for 47 to 54 minutes yep. so i wanted everything every single day and then thursdays or fridays was run through days depending on the length of the pieces might have to take two days to do all the run throughs with all the touch up work that we had to do with those pieces at the same time and uh it worked out fairly well for us and uh we also in the beginning of those weeks on the on the first four or five weeks there was always a sight reading piece at the end of every rehearsal and then there was a brief warm down where we just do lip slurs one, one more time to get the muscles to relax for the brass players. Cause knowing that after school, they'd be at least one to two other rehearsals yeah. that last two hours long. Yeah. So, um, I, I did want to mention when I, some of the stuff I do for, for warmups in my bands. Um, and I, I, I will say I use the metronome a lot. I, I use the keyboard a lot. That's through speakers. Um, I don't have a harmony director. There's a lot of people who, who swear by the harmony director. There's a lot of things you can do with that to help tune your band, and get your band with a better tone. It's expensive, but I, I do have some friends who use it. And I've heard a lot about that. So I'll plug that even though I have not really used that before. Um, some things that I do with my band that I think are a little bit different. Uh, first of all, we, I learned from a colleague a long time ago to have my kids memorize B flat. So we can, haven't been successful every time this year, but we can start the rehearsal by humming B flat before they've played. And that's really just a learned pitch. And it's, it's, it's been more simple than I thought it was going to be. But what we can do with that is then they can hum uh, up and down the scale as I wish, wish, just using numbers. If I put up a one, they hum one, two, three, four, five, so on and so forth. I can make that into two parts if I want uh, of the band and I can have them work on their pitch and their tone. I have them hum when they're more uh, shy, so the pitch stays in their head and they can hear it better. I'll then that have them open their lips to do a, a round O syllable or something like that as they're more um, more confident. Um, so I'll do things like that. You know, a lot of people will uh, use buzzing for brass players. I try to have them buzz a couple times a week. It should be every day. Um, you know, something where your woodwinds are playing something and the and the brass get to buzz along with that or. Uh, whatever and that's a huge deal for those people who are not not brass players um there's also they make this apparatus called the burp b-e-r-p right that goes onto the lead pipe and it doesn't really do a lot besides make it feel i can tell you as a brass player it makes it feel like you're playing the trumpet you know it gives the same feeling of it and you can use the valves and everything um and it really does help you know they're they cost a little bit of money but um they do work really really well um i'll use call and response as we'll get started sometimes, I'll play something on my trumpet um, and they'll have to play back. So it's a way, like in jazz band, to work on their ears as you're doing warm up. Um, and I do keep my trumpet with me all the time so I can model as much as I can for them. You know, a lot of teachers do that, but I think there's a lot of teachers who get away from that. Um, and I do, I always want to keep them doing, doing that. Um, another, th another thing I like to use is something called a scale grid. Um, which is not revolutionary. I do have this actually on the link to this episode. Um, people will be able to click on that PDF. It just has all the scales going in the circle of fifths 
from left to right. So like C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And then the next row is at the F scale and the next row is the B flat scale and it goes all the way around. And we'll do this when kids first come into high school as how I teach them all their scales. I don't teach them their scales one at a time. We work on the chromatic scale first um, within the first couple of weeks. And once they can do the full concert B flat chromatic scale, we'll then go to column one of that scale grid. So they'll play C and then F and then B flat and then E flat and then A flat and then D flat. They'll go all the way around and that takes a week or two to get it so they're all playing the right fingerings and they're all doing it. But once they can do that with a good sound, then the next week we can add the second column. So it's one, two, one, one, two, one, one, two, one, one, two, one, right? You just slowly build it. And I find within a semester, the kids have learned all their scales, but they learn them all from left to right rather than Okay, B flat, E flat, A flat. Okay, great. Here's the D flat week. Okay, here's the G flat week because that that gets into some hairiness, right? And then you end up getting all flats, and you got to move over to sharps at different times depending on the instruments, and that's that's like a hairy time to do it too. So I found that that approach works really well for our kids, um, and within that, you can work on articulation uh, and a thousand other things within that too. So you said your kids played all major scales. You know, how, how do you get to that point? Was your, was your approach like any similar to mine or completely different or how did that go? So, so quite similar. Uh, but what we did is we started like you did C and then we, we went to from there. And uh, but their midterm exam was uh, I had three cans in front of me and one was flat of keys, one was sharp keys one was either minor or chromatic keys. And for the midterm, I'd go in and pick out a slip and they had to play that from memory standing up in front of the band. Yeah. Then I'd pick up the next one for the flat keys and do the same thing there and that. And I, I, I tested them at least every week or every other week on their major scales to make sure they knew them as yeah. part of their grade. And uh, w we were fortunate. We had pull out lessons. So I saw every kid one lesson a week throughout the whole school year unless they were studying privately yeah. and if they studied privately then they only had to come in twice a semester twice a quarter pardon me to play for me to make sure that they were keeping up with everything else and then my colleague and i wrote a, a lesson book and that lesson book was part of a test that held, was held every friday where on page say we're working on page 10 that week page 10 there's exercises 1 through 15 and you get pick a slip of paper and you had to play that one for your grade for that week. And uh, it was based on, it was similar to the Charles Collin book, Jazz Rhythms, but it was a different style from that. And uh, that worked real well. I found that that helped my kids reading a, a tremendous amount. And um, what I, what I think if we go back to the scale thing for a second, what's really important is that both you and I insist that our kids learn their scales because because we say that there's no hard scales there's just unfamiliar ones right like there are a couple notes that sometimes are harder to play on an instrument right because of an awkward fingering or maybe it's really out of tune or something but for the most part uh, you know the majority of notes are not harder than others you know trombone fifth position is 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 one seventh position sixth position those are clearly harder right but for the most part if teachers insist that they find a way for their kids to learn their scales then it demystifies everything. And um, I think, you know, that's a really big deal because some teachers just say, well, we play one scale or maybe two or three, but there's all these other ones, you know, and the approach that I've taken, I feel really confident in that you go from the chromatic scale. And as long as you see them for a semester or so, you can get them confident in all these other scales. Now, when our kids graduate, do they like the key of B as much as they like the key of C? right? Like nobody does. <laughs> nobody does. But it really gets them on their on their way for that. Um, and, and, so, and for yeah. us, the little difference was that we had three orchestras. So from the three orchestras went against the three bands. So wind players would go to orchestra. So they were taught, especially the wind, woodwind players, the transposition, everything you had to do there for orchestra and play with strings. But, but the other thing is we based a lot of our teaching on rhythm patterns, we wanted to make sure that they knew as many of the rhythm patterns as possible. So when we would pick repertoire, one of our criteria in the department was that we picked at each concert based on a certain set of rhythms that we wanted to teach, plus the keys. And uh, the, that made them 
better readers, I thought, in the process. And yeah. since we did so much sight reading and so much testing on sight reading that uh, it pushed them forward or propelled them a little bit. I, I do I do want to do a quick plug. You know, I've gone through a lot of books that I've used and I couldn't really find a book that did everything that I wanted to. Um, so I do have a, a, a book that I wrote about eight years ago that isn't published or anything like that. It just has a bunch of stuff in it that I, as a band director, felt like I would want. I did put a sample of that in the, the link as well. So that PDF should be available for people um, who want to check it out. But in that, I, I basically did in each, there's a section in each key. Uh, right. So and they have like the different scale forms, a chromatic techniques and a major technique section. Then there's two articulation exercises, two interval exercises, three or four etudes, two me melodies that kids should know, like famous tunes that they could play in that key um, and four chorales where they could see all four parts um, and they could all read one part or they can move it around as well. So um, I, and I wrote that with the high school brain in mind. You know, there's an articulation exercise that I wrote that goes like right like the fourth note clearly changes because they think okay the first three are done well that's going to be the same um so the ability to to write that um has really worked well um for my kids um so you know I put that in there in case anybody wants to see that but that you know, that approach of having the songs to play was a really, really big deal. Um, I do want to take a quick pause and put a, a plug in for a business that I, I believe in very strongly. Jeff, Jeff, have you heard about Main Saxes? No. No. So Main Saxes is actually run by a friend of mine named Adam Montemi. Um, and uh, it's a great, uh, it's a one-on-one -on -one saxophone specialty shop providing expert repairs, sales, and private lessons just north of Portland in uh, New Gloucester, Maine. Owner Adam Montemi works with players individually by appointment, so only so you get uh, personalized attention whether you need saxophone repairs or you're shopping for a horn, mouthpiece, reeds, or accessories. And um, Main Saxes offers a, a carefully curated selection of overhauled vintage and modern saxophones, so you can test them in person, knowing they're playing at their full potential, as well as some of the new f uh, handmade mouthpieces from artisans like Aaron Drake and Morgan mouthpieces. Um, you can visit mainsaxes.com. That's like the state Maine, Main M A I N E. Uh, dot, uh, saxes com for more information or to browse the current inventory of fine saxophones um, and mouthpieces. So Adam's a good friend and, and I've had a lot of work done from him. And, you know, I'm not a saxophone player, but, uh, you know, people who've taught with me and um, speak really highly of his work. Great. Um, Jeff, did you know that kids join band not to hear you talk? <laughs> they join band so they can play their instruments and they can be with their friends. Do you agree or disagree? I will back it up a little bit differently. I will say that first, they want to be with their friends. And second, they've come to play. You are 100% correct. Band okay. directors much do not have people who want to stay in their bands. Okay, so the ones who talk too much. So time stopping to work on something has to be brief. You have to be able to read your students. Um, and we're going to give you a lot of tips coming up here about how to rehearse things quickly and efficiently and all that. I try to keep it 60 seconds or less. Now, my wife would say in middle school, 15 seconds or less, right? Like if their horn is on their face, they can't get in trouble. Well, it's a lot harder for them to get in trouble. Um, so I think too many people stop and they just get talking and talking and talking. And I think if we record our rehearsals, all of us do it too much. But just I would rather err on the side of having the kids play too much than not enough. Um, Agreed. But, but I think part of the problem that occurs with band directors is that when we stop, we don't demand a clear stop mm -hmm. and that there is silence during rehearsal. Our rule was real simple. When rehearsal began, if you had a question, the only time you talked is when you raised your hand and you were acknowledged. If you talked during the rehearsal, there was a consequence. Then it, you were given the opportunity to talk, and sometimes I'd say, okay, section leaders, you need to take care of this. Talk to your sections right now. Yep. But when I back up on the podium, it was silent. And I think that's the problem. I, I watch many band directors rehearse. They cut off and A, B, C, D, the groups of people just don't, they just play right through the cutoff. Yep. And that's got to be clear, and that's got to be concise, just as 
the beginning of a note has to be clear and concise. Attacks and releases, if you focus on that just through your rehearsal technique, then you don't have to talk as much. And then if you take Peter Boonshaft over at Hofstra, he did a great seminar at the Eastern MENC con conference many years ago, talking about a rehearsal where the director doesn't say a word, mm -hmm. but rehearse the piece without saying a word. Yep. And I walked do it at an all Eastern conference where he rehearsed for an hour without saying a word to the group. That's crazy, right? Yep. It's wonderful though. Get a lot done. So one of the big things I, that I am a proponent of is while you're listening to the music, right? As you're listening, think about what you're going to say when you stop. One of, you know, my mentor and a very good friend of mine, Andy Boysen, always, he would always touch the score when there was a mistake that he wanted to come back to. Because he was taught that, and I don't know where he learned this from, but there's something with the brain waves that when you touch that measure physically, it's easier to go back and remember what it was. And he says, you know, always try to try to get this list of things that you want to go back and get. And you basically have to stop for, he would always say, I think it was, um, stop when your brain is full. Like when you can't remember anymore, stop and go back and fix them. I, I don't always get to that many because... Um, or I might get to more because I want the kids to keep playing. But too many people just don't know what they're going to do when they stop, right? They stop and then they look down, and that's when the kids are going to have problems. Well, well and another point is that if there's a problem in the music, I never stop at the problem. I wait quite a few measures before I would go back and discuss it because that teaches the kids to stop when there's a mistake. Yep. And my comment always was, well, in the middle of a concert, you make a mistake. We're all going to stop and say, audience, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've made a mistake. We have to start again. You have to teach them to play beyond the mistake and fight through it and then go back. And I think Andy's point is well taken. I, I didn't use the hand, but I used to keep sticky notes next to my stand. And I just pick one up and lay it on a spot and pick one and lay on a spot. And when I got to four stickies down, then I'd play a little beyond and I'd go back and review the four stickies to yep. talk about it. Yeah. That way I, and I just pull them up. When I actually, no, I lie. I used to leave them down because then when I'd go back and review my score that night, I'd say, okay, this are potential problem areas that we have to rediscuss and see how, what approach we need to make it. So it's better imprinted into the student's head. Yep. Okay. So one thing, so now let's talk about when you stop, here are some things you can do to help fix things. Right. Cause like, okay, you figured out something's wrong. Did you figure out what was wrong? Did you figure out why it's wrong? Do you know how to fix it? Do you know how to fix it in a way that the 13-year-old or the 11-year-old or the 9-year-old, that's kind of young, 10-year-old or the 17-year-old, that they're ready to do it? And you have to approach the human in that way, right? So first thing for me is when I try to fix it, I try to involve as many students as possible in teaching it. So if it's a rhythm concept, I'll throw a rhythm on the board or have it there already, right? Um, and the kids have to clap it, they learn how to count it, whatever, the whole band does it. Then if the clarinets can't play that rhythm, we'll all clap the rhythm once we've learned it, and then the clarinets can play along with as we clap it. So the kids who are not in the clarinet section are, time goes faster because they're being taught, they learn the rhythm, and they help the clarinets do it as they do it. Another, another tip that I'll use is something called Pat With Me, which I get from some of my great general music friends. Right. So if in general music, a lot of times they'll say, OK, everybody pat the beat with me. Right. And you just kind of whatever that piece is. And then the person starts singing. Well, what I do is um, if I'm going to say, OK, we're going to work on the saxophone section. We're going to do this. Um, everybody saxophones measure 71. Everybody pat with me. So I'll count it off. And the band knows if I don't have the metronome on, they know that they're responsible for patting the tempo as they as the as the, the saxophones play. And what does that do for them? Well, A, it helps the saxophones by helping the kids help them keep the beat. Has everybody has to listen to the saxophone part in order to keep the beat with it, right? And most importantly, they're still doing something. They're not sitting there doing nothing. So, you know, the average time of, they're not playing, but they're they're invested and they're involved in that. Um, and, then, and then, quite frankly, it, when I fix one thing, Jeff, I put it back, okay, that was 73. Once they got it, great. Everybody at 73, here we go. And then we see if they can do it with everybody in. And maybe we even do it more than once. Because too many people will fix 73, and then they move on to 88. You know? Right. They never put it in context. Now, I think we'd probably agree, maybe we won't, that the older the kids are, you might not have to do that step. You know, I know when I was at UNH, again, Dr. Boysen would say, all right, let's fix 48, blah, 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 got it. Let's fix 98, blah, blah, let's got it. Let's fix 50, blah, 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 got it. Beginning, here we go. 
you know, and the older musicians can put that in place. But I find for high school kids, definitely middle school kids, once you fix the problem, then have everybody play it at the same time on their own parts to see if they can do it in context. Well, my general philosophy always was always this. Don't practice what you know. Practice what you don't know. And everybody can play the beginning of a piece well. And just about everybody can play the end of a piece well. But it's everything from those first 10 measures and those last 10 measures that if you listen carefully, that's where rehearsals haven't functioned. And, and I do exactly the things that you do, but I do one thing differently. When we sight read, because we use this in our learning of music, is that the first time we go through a piece, we count the rhythms like one, one, two, one, three, four, one, one, whatever. I'd count through the one, two, and three, four, five, six. And then we'd go through our one, two, three, four, five, six. Everybody would count the rhythms because we used the, a numeric syllabic system. And then when we'd come to a problem, like you said, where the clarinets couldn't play a rhythm, we'd either put it up on the board and we'd, we'd talk through it. And everybody would play that rhythmical pattern on their instruments mm -hmm. so that they could get used to it. And in most cases, if we know we should know our scores well enough realize well the clarinets have it here but later the flutes have it here yep. the trumpet here the saxophones have it here let's all go to those sections and play those and if they aren't harmonically correct well then let's all play them on a concert whatever but yep. if and if they're not harmonically correct, i'd say sometimes let's still play them together so we articulate them the same way and we play the rhythms the same way and then go back and separate it and similar to what andy said you know 47, 58, 64 for the older groups, and then maybe start at 35 and go through 70 a few times to make sure that that's imprinted into what they're thinking about doing. Yep. Yep. I, I use uh, whisper counting when we're working on rhythm too, you know, because then they, instead of, you know, saying the counts works really well, but then sometimes they have a problem putting it on the horn. So that's the intermediary. If you can say one, two, and three, and then they go, tss, 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 tss. You know, my wife calls it wazoodling at the middle school. We call it whisper counting. Um, I've also found that if you whisper count with them, like if they're doing something and you want to help them work with a rhythm, while the band's playing, if you whisper count like that from the podium, it cuts through the whole band and, they, and the kids can hear it even as they're playing. So it's a, it's a way to help them with a rhythm if you need to um, as, as it's coming around. Um, one thing that works really well, if, if, the, if it's a finger problem, I've actually had sections do this where okay everybody here's a run we have to go de da 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 de da 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 dum right we don't play they just have to finger it and they have to finger it hard enough so that we hear the clicks of the keys or of the valves so then what you're hearing is and when it's all gross then if they just get the clicks to line up then they go ahead and play it and it usually has fixed the fingers so that's a that's a good one for for fingers i don't know if you've used that or not but that that works for me I didn't um, call it whisper tonguing, but I but yeah. I did exactly that was and then uh, the clicking of the horns, yeah. But also I would have them do the clicking of the horns, and I have what you call whisper tonguing do that do that at the same time. So they're using their fingers, but they're using their whisper tonguing separate from rather than in conjunction with. Great, that's good. Um, um, many times I'll have the metronome going. When I was younger, I wouldn't use metronome. I just find that even on ballads and things, these young kids, like that steady beat is just not ingrained in them. They need to continue to have that going forward. For me, it's not just a marching band tool. It's a jazz band tool. It's a concert band tool. It's a wind ensemble tool. It's a percussion ensemble tool. It's a everything. If you can't, if you don't know where the beat is, you're going to have a hard time doing everything else. So I don't use it forever, but I do use it consistently. Um, there's sometimes when I want to quickly get a metronome to happen and I'll have the snare drummer in back. Hey, would you give me eighth notes, please? Right? So you hear it, that, 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 that. And then they can, you can have, have the part so they're listening back rather than listening forward um, to the metronome. So that's another um, thought that I had. I, I also think, Jeff, sometimes we don't let the kids fix what they can fix. Right? So I, you know, sometimes somebody hears, you hear the mistake once and you go try to fix it as a teacher. But it's mm -hmm. like sometimes if you know they're new at it, sometimes they need a couple checks, a couple of runs to figure out what they can figure out. So, and I'm an advocate for that, you know, you know, but at the same time, if you go, well, let's just let them play it a thousand times. Well, they're not going to get better if you just play, 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 play. So I think when we advocate for the kids playing a lot, they have to also be given the right tools when needed. But, you know, if you hear them screw it up like three times, to me, it's like, okay, I, now I know we need to work on that. 
Um, at the same time, there's also other stuff that you know you have to teach before they do it once. I also believe in giving section leaders a chance to talk. And uh, I'll stop and I'll say, ask the section leader to say, could you address section whatever it is and have them go through and talk to the kids? Because that builds a spree de corps and leadership within the group so that the group realizes that there are members within the group that can help them. And then I quite often would say, okay, section leader, please help the third clarinets. Please just take a second, go up into the back studio room and go over that and come back in five minutes. And they take the third clarinets and go over it with them so that I could work on something else with another group of kids. And um, I always had my clarinet ready to go. Um, and then I'd always have a, trombone or a euphonium there and i just slam a mouthpiece in and go up and play with them because sometimes when i since i'm not a brass player and i'm a woodwind player if perfect. i play it no one's, I, no one's perfect you know this fingering combination might work better but as a woodwind player i'll talk about you know alternating sides the slides that you can use what the alternate fingerings are you can get to get a different pattern to go to come out. It, it, it's like, uh, I'll use one of Andy's pieces, uh, Dan's on number two. He has this section where it's going between uh, altissimo B flat to a upper altissimo F. And just by the simple using of the one and one for the B flat, going to the long F dot. Are you talking about clarinet? Talking about clarinet, but it also occurs in the, uh, in the alto sax where I could use some alternate fingerings there too. Uh, things like that to help the kids. Uh, quite often, you you go to watch festivals and you'll see kids using certain fingerings and you're saying, boy, they're working really hard. And if they just would change their fingering to such and such, they wouldn't have to work as hard. So you, you mentioned festivals, right? I'm a big proponent for this. Anybody who listens to this in Maine knows this, but I manage like as much as I can manage. And when I mean manage, I mean... You know, when we have an all-state band, I'm managing that all-state band. I get the conductor and I, I help pick the literature and I, I do that. Or, or, for, or for District 1 or for jazz band or whatever. I, I love doing that because I get to pick who I think are really good teachers. And then, mm -hmm. I get, and then I get to learn from those teachers every time we have a festival. So, you know, if you're in a place where you can manage... A, a festival do it because you ensure that your kids have a good experience and you get to learn a ton um and at the same time you know if you're not managing and you're at a festival go and listen to the band you know like you might have theory work to grade and that's fine and you might have other stuff to do but like if you have a great conductor there if you get one thing from it it's worth the time so do your theory grades but while you're in the auditorium you know sit and listen to them talk and, and you'll hear them discuss things um, so I'm a big proponent of that, you know, seeing people teach as often as you can. And I said that because you mentioned the festivals. I, I did yep. want to mention one other thing. Um, though you talk about warming down at the end of every rehearsal. I was taught end on the cool part, the cool, strong, loud part that so that when they leave rehearsal, that's what they remember and they want to come back next rehearsal. Well, see, we spent because my marching season started two weeks before school, we spent a lot of time talking about physical health and the physical development of the instrumental player. And so that was something that we stressed that you have to think about the physical health of the player. And, uh, you know, I would be, I'd be up on my soapbox saying, okay, I want you to drink a lot of water tonight. I want you to warm down. I want you to do this. And, with my staff, with marching band, we did that all the time. And we just carried it directly into the concert and the jazz program. And uh, it worked out real well. We, we didn't always end with the cool part, but we ended with something that we showed success. But most of the time I ended with sight reading. So yep. sometimes reading is not the most successful thing in the world. Yep. So, but we, we, we knew that that's something we had to do because many of the festivals we went to, whether it was IAJE or, or what have you, or ASBDA, you had to compete or do your festival where the last thing you did was sight read. Yep. And we came up with a system that worked well for us. And everybody thought we were nuts because we'd go, you'd get your two minutes for the director to look at the score yep. and then five minutes for the band to review it. And I didn't have the kids play during the review. I'd ask them their, their 10 key cast questions, key signature repeats, et cetera, et cetera. And then we would start from the beginning and we would count the rhythms from the beginning of the piece yep. to the end of the piece. Yep. And then 
say, okay, it's time to play. And my colleagues would look at me like I was totally nuts, but I said, you know, they know how to play the piece. It's just a matter of putting the fingers down, yeah. but I know the fingers don't all go down. At least the rhythms will be correct as we go through the piece. And if we ran into a section where the rhythm was a problem, we finish it and say, okay, rhythm measure such and such. This is what you got to look at. It's a dotted eight, 16th, eighth, dotted eight, 16th, eighth, six, eight, two, one and three, four and six. Let's review that and get stuff like that. And, um, you know, I'll go back to the festival thing you were talking about. I was, I started out in Jews. I was manager of everything I could be. And then in Connecticut, I ended up being the chairman of the Student Affairs Commission, which was in charge of creating these festivals and getting the guest conductors. And what we did in Connecticut when we had to get our CEUs is we came up with a plan. And that was when a director went in and watched the rehearsal, there was a, 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 a person in every rehearsal awarding CEUs to directors who would come into rehearsals and sit and watch the director rehearse. Yep. And what that created was an atmosphere of, We'd, we'd started buying scores so there would be sample scores in the back of the room so as the directors walked in they could open a score and follow with the guest conductor what's going on and i remember um it's funny we do things so similarly jeff we don't talk about that stuff but we do exactly the same thing at Allstate. you know i have a bunch of scores there for people and you know, we, we haven't talked about the CEU thing, but I, you know, we do have a formal way in Allstate to do that. But I feel like that should happen more at these festivals. You know, I don't know who has to sign it, has to sign that document or whatever, but like that would be to, to be great because that's the best professional development you're going to get. Oh, yeah. I knocked off all of my CEUs for yeah. a year at Allstate and at Regional Music Festival every year because it was the greatest way you were sitting there doing that instead of going in the back room listening to somebody complain about why their band or the board of education isn't doing something right. on music all the time and watching you know i we saw peter boonchef quite a frank to kelly we watched them in their technique yon de may when he came in and conducted we just sit there or uh jeff renshaw seeing how they how they did things and how they ran a rehearsal and then a lot of us when we'd go out to dinner with them afterwards we'd talk about it we, we didn't just talk about mundane things we talked about what happened in rehearsals with these guest conductors to learn what their philosophies were and why they did what they did and how they did that's the way to, you have to be at the festival anyway with your kids you might as yep. well get something out of it Right. It, it learned so much. I remember when Earl McDonald came in and did all state jazz, it was like, knock your socks off. So many things we learned that fast. Or so John Mastriani coming in and doing jazz. You learn things that you, you thought, well, yeah, we should be doing that all the time. <laughs> so um, next, I want to talk about some basic tips of programming as we select the music that the kids are going to be playing. This is not a programming episode. I don't think it's more like a toolbox of things you can use in rehearsal. Um, but I just had some notes of things. So I think we'll have an episode later about like some really good programming tips and maybe a lot of great literature that you and I maybe compile and like. And there's lots of those lists out there, right? And there's state lists and all these things. But it's also different to have experience with pieces. Like I know this piece works for ninth graders. Or I know this, like this piece works for X type of band or whatever. So I have a lot of things for programming that I want to talk about because I've always prided myself in no matter what the kids play, when they're at a performance, they sound good. No parents are going to leave going, you know what? There wasn't enough notes in the first clarinet part. <clears throat> you know, they were going like, you know, the amount of kids, parents that have come up and said, oh my gosh, your band sounds like professionals. Now, you know that they don't, right? And, but... From the untrained ear, they don't hear all the mistakes. And they're expecting to come out and hear a program that's like, oh, well, they're kids, you know? No, like I always wanted them to sound really good. I wanted the kids to love the music that they were playing. And I wanted the audience to really enjoy listening to the music they were playing. Now, that's really hard. You might think, well, that means you're going to play all cheesy music. No, no, no. That's not how I approach it. But I approach it like I'm trying to teach the audience, but I want them to enjoy this concert. If dad and mom are coming and sitting through this concert and they're not enjoying it, well, that's going to be a big deal, right? If you want if you want to create buzz around your program, get them to sound good. Remember when I started in the school that I'm in now in Westbrook, like we started with stuff that was way easier than we really probably should have been playing at for their age level, but they sounded so good, nobody cared. Um, so here's a couple of my basic tips. 
Program what your kids need, not what you you own already, A. <laughs> Just because you have it in the library doesn't mean you need to play it. Or B, what you think sounds good. Like, you might think it's a cool piece, but can your third clarinet section play that third clarinet part? Can your second alto player play that second alto part? And check out the scores, check out the parts, and is it within reach? Is it a good stretch for them? Or is it the wrong thing? So like some people will go on August 31st, they'll walk through the library, grab three pieces, and there's our music. You know, I think it needs to be much more thoughtful than that. I think we need to program a mixture of moods, not a mixture of styles. Not, okay, I'm going to do a march, I'm going to do a ballad, I'm going to do a focus piece. It's like, okay, like that's really well-intentioned. And maybe you do end up doing that. But like... If you think of it as we're doing a really happy piece, we're doing a really like love piece, we're doing a really like angry piece, right? We're doing something that's traditional. Like you think of it that way. And then all those kids have the different personalities and they all get to then buy into certain pieces and it helps them express their emotions uh, in that way too. Um, I suggest that you think of your percussion when you do music and that you move them around. Don't say this kid just plays snare drum, this kid just plays timpani. Find a way for them to be busy and active. And if you need to add parts, add parts. You know, find stuff um, that works. Like I love Frank DeKelly's music, but if you have seven or eight percussionists, there's just not a lot to do for them. Now, if you have four, then it works really well, but it's hard to double or to split some of those parts up. So save those for when the band um, has less percussionists. I have a couple more, Jeff. Do you want to jump in or can I? should I keep going? Let me just jump in. I, I think there's two things we have to think about when we program. And that is, as the conductor, are you conducting this piece because you want to have fun conducting it? Or are you trying to teach your children something that they need to know? Often we go to festivals and we see conductors doing this wonderful job conducting, except what they're doing and what we're hearing aren't the same thing. Yep. It's just because the conductor wants to challenge themselves. Uh, the other the other part is that when you pick your repertoire, you know your group. You know what they can achieve. You need to study the scores before you pick it and make sure that it's within their realm of achievement and growth and growth and i think that's the one thing some directors miss they look for just achievement and they don't look for growth yep so if my kids work on this they can achieve this yes right? and this is an opportunity for that for example you know like i have my my first trumpet section can consistently play say g right now g to a on trumpet is a tough change but you've got some time you know, and they've been on G for a long time. Well, this piece uses A. And maybe we're doing it because I want them to stretch to A. And maybe that's the reason you're doing, that's one of the reasons why you choose that piece over another piece. Above all, we have to remember when they perform, they're going to sound good. So when you're pushing them, try to make it so that the performance, they still sound good. You know, now occasionally we've all had these things where like the performance, you listen back and you're like, ugh. Like that didn't, that didn't go the way I wanted it to. It didn't end up with the recording I wanted or the performance that we wanted. But then a great friend of mine, Alan King, who's a, just a fantastic brass teacher and friend, he always said, yeah, but Kyle, sometimes what they learned in that piece, in that instance, was more important than how they performed it, right? Now, not, not, not that we want to not sound good, but he said, you know, it was still worth it that you did that because they learned all this stuff through that piece. And then I say, yeah, but couldn't we have done that with another piece, you know? Um, so that hasn't happened often, but it does happen. Yeah, one second and on, on what Alan's saying there. I, I think that's really valid, but I also come with the thing is that not every piece that I have in the book will I perform. Yeah. Sometimes I have a great piece of literature in there, not for the purpose of having it be performance, but because of what it teaches the kids to do. Yes. Think about what each student is asked to play in the piece. Is it too easy? And I know too easy is a thing that doesn't really exist, right? It's not too easy. But in their mind, is it too easy? Is it too hard? Is there a mixture where it's like there's a little bit of all of it? Get the kids to buy into it and the audience to enjoy the program. Not to say that it's cheesy again, but that it's quality music and you'll create buzz. For example, 
there's an arranger's publishing piece called Divinum Mysterium, arranged by Tom Wallace, which is like this old plain chant thing. This thing just kicks. I mean, it's so good. And it's like three minutes long, and it's like kind of an obscure kind of piece, but it's so good. And I found it starts, I think it's F. I think it starts with F in the bells, or it chimes. And, or it, sorry, it ends with F in the chimes. And there's another piece from the same publisher called I Saw Three Ships, right? From the, the famous English Carol. And that starts with an F in the chimes. So what I would do is I would put the two pieces together and we would play one right into the other one. And before you know it, it's like a Christmas tune to open a concert. That's amazing music, but it's not like really Christmassy, but it's just such good music that the kids can play. <laughs> And at the end, oh my gosh, I know that tune. Oh my gosh, the band was so good. That was that was so great. And you made you made a good point earlier. I, I think your idea there was really good. That the audience has to enjoy your concert as well. Yeah. And I think some directors lose sight of the fact that you can you can keep your kids all engaged, but if the audience walks out and says, "Well, that was nice," nice is not the word that I would like to hear. Yeah. Like that. I really enjoyed that. That's that's what I like to hear. You know, and if they do that concert after concert, then you have a little bit of leash to the year I did. Do you know the piece by Dan Buckfitch, the great composer and teacher out in uh, Idaho? Um, it's called Unusual Behaviors and Ceremonies Involving Drums. It's like this 25 minute thing about, you know, they did a... Uh, um, they did a research paper about the physiological, uh, what happens in the brain for these African tribes when they're doing... Um, tribal drumming these drum circles and they go for 24 hours and they don't use the bathroom or eat or get tired or anything and the whole piece is around that well that piece was like playing on the planet mars for half of the piece but because there was enough history that we had done over all these years of these concerts everybody enjoyed i was able to put that with a couple other things people really liked and the kids learned a, a bunch of things through it um so as we as we wrap up um students i think should love the music you're programming for them um, maybe not all of it, but they can grow to love it. Um, and if they just like, eh, this is fine, then you're not choosing the right music, right? There's such good music out there for them. I do a survey after the concerts on students' favorite pieces, as well as what did the other band play? What did they like? What did you like from them and all that? But if a piece doesn't get any votes as somebody's favorite, I won't do that piece again. So 40 kids do votes, you know, X piece, nobody thought it was their favorite. Uh, in my my the music I choose usually it's about split evenly that just about every piece has a large number of kids who that was their favorite piece and sometimes you choose a piece for other reasons and you know it's not going to be as popular um, but that's the general approach uh, I like to take and I strongly believe every band can sound good at performances if taught well and programmed for correctly right do you choose easy enough music but also challenging enough music and do you teach it appropriately no, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, I, th I think the voting is something that I used to do, especially when we come back from a festival. And I'd say, well, you went around and listened to other bands. Did you hear a piece that really knocks your shorts off and you'd like to do? And they'd come up with names. And I'd say, okay, I'll put together a list so you can find them on YouTube and you can listen to them. And uh, let's talk about it some more. And that's how some of the repertoire we picked was because they I said, we really like this piece. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to do that. And that worked out quite well for us. Well, thank you, Jeff. The second episode was fun. Um, hope people are enjoying the podcast and um, we'll be back next week with you guys. Thank you for listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe too. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, if you have the time, we highly recommend the After Sectionals podcast for more great listening. Thank you for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.